So we start out very simply here. We start out by building up the molecules, building up the spectra, uh, looking at chemical shifts, looking at integrations, looking at shapes, looking at patterns, and then we can go the other direction. By the end of the week, we should be going the other direction, looking at a big complicated spectrum and deciding what exactly the molecule is from the data given. So we have put together some of these fairly simple graphs and we've looked at uh, shapes or signals that don't have much in terms of shape. And we should be confident now with the idea that the chemical shift is often dependent upon electronegativity and the electron environment. So we saw multiple signals. We saw the uh, building up of a more complex spectrum here where the benzene ring doesn't have equivalent protons. They're non-equivalent, so you'd see multiple signals. And by today, you should be okay with the idea that an aldehyde goes all the way downfield. A carboxylic acid is further downfield than that. And in recitation, we're starting to put this together in terms of using IR, NMR, mass spec, and what have you, to determine what happened, what happened in the chemical reaction. Uh, so we've been building this up in a fairly sort of gentle way so far. Today we'll get into the more complex stuff, talking about patterns. Uh, you should be happy now with chemical shift, what it means, where they show up. You are given that chart in front of you, uh, but don't, you know, don't, don't memorize those numbers. Be, used, be um, able to use it quickly. Talk about integration, the area under the curves. It's fortunate that this is now a ratio of the, of the number of types of hydrogens that you have. So in this situation where you have a uh, carboxylic acid here, the H down there is, is down at 11 ppm, it's worth one proton. You measure that area, you normalize it to one on your digital integrator, and you find that now this will be one and this will be five. And as we head into the benzene chemistry, we'll see that this is split into uh, three patterns because of the fact that we have protons on that benzene ring which are different. Across the ring, they might be the same through symmetry, but there are three different types, therefore three different signals. And if you break that integration down further, it would be two to one to two, and that would help you work out exactly which proton is which. Now, for many of you heading into biomedical type stuff, or biological um, uh, graduate work, this is now very useful for proteins, to be able to work out protein structure, be able to work out complex uh, polysaccharide and oligosaccharide structures. So we know the basics, then we can take it further. Uh, what we'll start talking about today are these shapes in more detail. Where do the shapes come from? How do you predict them? And then how do you use them to work out structure? So we're going to talk about n plus 1, and then when you see a graph, n minus 1. That'll tell you the number of neighbors. Uh, we started, I think, talking about these shapes, and, and we should spend some time worrying about what those things are, and then talk about where they come from. So very quickly, I'm going to start out today with this picture. And it shows you a spectrum with a or of a molecule with two different types of H. Everybody in the class should be able to handle the fact that there are two different types of H in that molecule. And I've labeled them as red and blue. Now, chemical shift-wise, you should be OK with that straight away. The idea that the blue hydrogen is next to the chlorines. Chlorines are electron withdrawing, and so they de-shield, and so it goes further downfield. So the signal down at 5.5, 5.6, is for the blue hydrogen. It's small because there's only one of those blue hydrogens. On the right-hand side of the spectrum, we have the signal for the red hydrogens. It's large because there are three of them. So the area under the curve is, is greater, is larger. In terms of their shapes, we've got to remember now it's all about the neighbors. The shape of the signal you are looking at is determined by the neighbors and their orientation in the big magnet. Okay, we're going to talk about the big magnet again and putting the molecule in this big magnetic field and the magnets, the nuclei, will align themselves either with or against. You only have two options. And depending, depending upon the alignment of those protons, you will see different what we call interference patterns. We call them coupling patterns or uh, shapes of signals. And this now will be very useful in terms of working out structure. So chemical shift, we've done. You should be OK with that. Ask questions if you need to in recitation and office hours. In terms of uh, shapes of signals, that's today. So this on the right-hand side has two lines associated with the signal. This is one signal. It is not two signals. It is one signal split into two. And today we'll call it a doublet. I have a slide coming up which defines all of these words, so if you can't read my scribble, it'll all be laid out neatly for you. That's a doublet. We'll see how we know it's a doublet a little bit later when we talk about the relationship between the gap between those lines and the gaps between those lines. They happen to be the same. If they are coupling, you will get the same gaps between the lines, and that's how you work out they are actually neighbors. Uh, so we have a doublet, and down here we have a, a signal that has four components to it. It is not four signals. It is one signal split into four components. Okay, and we'll call this a quartet. Okay, so now we've got a quartet and we've got a Dublin. We've got to worry about where these things come from. So to get this started, we'll just say, okay, in the case of the blue hydrogen, how many neighbors do we have? Three. So what's n plus one? Four, right? So n equals three, n plus one equals four. It's that simple. That tells you you're expecting to see a, a signal with four components to it. Now the shape of that signal and the actual uh, geometry of this thing, why are the two outer pieces lower and the two higher pieces 
uh, higher, that's coming up in a second. But right now we're just trying to deal with m plus 1. In this example, uh, the red hydrogens have one neighbor, the blue hydrogen. So the signal for the red hydrogen, which is this one, gets split into two lines. That's a doublet. For the blue hydrogen, again, we say that we have it three neighbors, one, two, three, and m plus one here to work out the signal shape will be four, which is a quartet. First example. And the only way you can learn this is by examples and practice. Next example. We modified it slightly. We went away from one hydrogen. We've now got three and two. Which is which? Which signal is for the red hydrogens? One on the left or on the right? The one on the right. The other left. Okay? This is for the red. That's for the methyl group. Now, be careful here. It is not a triplet because there are three of them. Okay? It is not a triplet because there are three of them. It is a triplet because there are two neighbors. So n is 2. So n plus 1 is 3. Therefore, triplet. And by the end of this week, we've got to get very good at this. We've got to learn about the graphs. We've got to learn about the, the numbers underneath when we give you the data in text form and then be able to very quickly go backwards and forwards between different spectra, including IR, including mass spec, including C13 spectra, to work out complex problems. And this really does sort people out. Now, what about this down here? What shape is that? What's the name for it? It's a quartet. Okay, It's a quartet. Now, that's corresponding to the blue hydrogens. Why is it so far downfield compared to the other one? Because the bromine's electron withdrawing, right? So on your chart, what type of protons are we looking at? Be our neighbor. So hopefully it shows in that region, approximate region of where that shows up on your chart. So now we have to worry about its shape. We're looking at the shape for the blue hydrogens. The blue hydrogen shape depends upon the neighbors. How many neighbors? How many neighbors do the blue hydrogens have? How many neighbors, how many hydrogens on that carbon? Three. So what's n plus one? Four. That's where you get four lines in your signal. So we have a quartet and we have a triplet. And by the end of the day, I'll show you some very simple patterns that you should be able to look at and recognize every time. A, an ethyl group like this, a CH3, CH2 group, always shows that pattern, a triplet and a quartet. We'll see an isopropyl group always has a certain pattern. A t-butyl group always has a certain pattern. And if that's, you, know, that you have that information with you, it's very quick to be able to put those pieces together. You will see those signals and immediately recognize, I have a t-butyl group. That helps you put structures together. So far, so good, right? Two signals, two types of protons, chemical shifts based on electronegativities, alkyl versus, versus be our neighbor. And now the shapes, I haven't explained where the shapes come from yet, but the shapes are based on this n plus 1 rule. More complicated system here. This will happen in both directions. You've got to count in both directions. If you have neighbors in both directions, you must count in both directions. So let's think about the blue hydrogen. Which signal is the blue hydrogen on my graph? Left or right? Left. Why is it so small? There's only one of them, as opposed to six for the other one. Now, be very careful here. As the, complex, as, the, as the splitting pattern gets more complex, you can take a singlet and make it into a doublet, and the signal gets smaller. But it might still be the same integration, because you're now, you're now splitting the area under two curves. And if you went to a, what is this? This is a, a, a sextet or a septet. The area gets very small, because you're, or the curve gets very small, because you're spreading the same area under, under a whole bunch more lines. So how many neighbors does the blue hydrogen have? Six, not three, right, six. They all split. So what's the answer here? How many lines in my signal? Seven, we'll call that a septet. There are seven lines in that signal. And this will be, again, a common pattern. This is an isopropyl group. You see this pattern again and again, a septet with a doublet at the top. That then is an isopropyl group. It speeds you up, being able to put the answers together. So how many, you know, these, these hydrogens on the right are the same as these hydrogens on the left. That should be okay by now. They're chemically equivalent, they're magnetically equivalent. How many neighbors do they have? Just the one. So the shape, therefore, is a doublet, which is that right there. So again, it's all based on the neighbors. You just practice it, and you decide that, uh, you know, you're okay with the M plus 1 idea in terms of you using it. And now we'll have to explain where it comes from. So we've got to try and explain where these pictures come from. And these are the sort of, you know, these are the, the defined... Uh, structures for signals in NMR spectroscopy. We can see here the application of the M plus 1 rule. If you have no neighbors, there's no interference. Therefore, you get a singlet. If you have one neighbor, it turns out to be split into two. There is interference. You see an interference pattern on the spectrum, which we call a doublet. If you have two neighbors, N plus 1 equals 3, and we see a triplet. What we should see from this particular slide is the shape. Obviously, with one line, it's, it's just one line. But with two lines, they're the same height. If they're the same height, chances are it's a doublet. 
In this example here, you have a definite pattern. The two outer portions are smaller than the middle portion. In fact, the middle portion is twice as high as the outer two portions. We'll see that in a second and why, where that comes from. For a quartet, it's a little bit different. We have two outer portions, which are, uh, I think it's one third the height of the two middle pieces. And this is all going to be do, to do with permutations of magnets, the permutations of what the neighbors can be doing when the particular proton hits its resonance signal. When we hit the right frequency for the resonance, what's happening next door? Are they with the field or against the field? And that will make a big difference in terms of the shapes. Quintet, again, we'll see is a bit more complicated. We won't define the quintet in, in terms of showing you where it comes from, but the M plus one rule does apply. Sextet, again, is more complicated with six lines, and septet is now getting to the limit of what you can see on a, an exam or what you can see on a, on a chart. After that, we might just say M. And M is for multiplet. Multiplet is more complicated than a septet. Okay, so if you see M, it means there's an awful lot more complication in terms of what's happening with the uh, communication between the neighbors. And we will have to worry about those. So you need to know those shapes. And as I ask, like the textbook does, to draw, you, I want you to draw a spectrum on the, on the exam. I want you to practice drawing these things. Okay? And, you know, keep the artistic flourish to a, to a minimum. I'd like to see triplets look like that. You know, that, that's fine for a triplet. That, I'm not, I don't know. I don't know what that is. And I do see people try to draw spectra um, in which look, look like forests. They just look like a forest. It's a very pretty picture of a forest. It needs to look like the structure. And again, I take this back to the cyclohexane. If you can draw a cyclohexane after a bit of practice, you can draw these signals after a bit of practice. Okay, and some of you, those of you who have, you know, uh, you know, you're thinking about medicine and stuff like that, and you have to do things like MRI, you have to worry about the outcome of those things, be able to read those charts, you're going to take this an awful lot further. This is the very basic stuff to get started with. So there are our shapes, all based on M plus 1. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from, or the, the shapes can be predicted by, I should say, the use of Pascal's triangle. This is now going to show you the potential shapes for these signals, based on Pascal's triangle. So the whole point of this is to say that, okay, these two numbers here, add them together, you get this number. You've seen this before? Yeah? Add these two numbers together here, you get these numbers here. Keep going, you add these two numbers, one and three, you get four. That, you're not interested in that. But it just happens to coincide with signal shape. There's a singlet in which you have one line. There's a doublet in which you have two lines of equal intensity. Here's a triplet in which you have three lines, the outside one is one, and the outside of one is one, and the inside of which is twice as high. So you can use this to actually predict the signal shapes. And we can go all the way down here to sextet, in which you have six lines, outside is one, inside is five, then twice as big, then twice as big, and then five again. You don't need to worry about that. You need to worry about where this comes from. You need to worry about how do we develop these line shapes? What's the background to that? Well, I go back to this picture, just to refresh your memories about what's physically happening here. If you take a sample, and you'd make a sample in your laboratory, then you have magnets in your sample, because you have nuclei that are protons and carbons, and they are magnetic. And if there isn't a big magnet, and I mean by a big magnet, you know, something the size of me, this, this thing is about six feet tall, and that is a big magnet, and the magnets inside that big magnet will do as they're told. Yes? They're not just going to go in any, any which way. This is outside the magnetic field, and as soon as you drop your sample into the can, Inside that big magnetic field, which is often referred to as B0, those magnets will line up one of two ways. They will line up, as we say, with the field, and they will line up against the field. Now, if my field is, is generically pointing in this direction, this is with the field, that's with the field, that's with the field. This is against, and this is against. What do you think is lower energy, with the field or against? With. And then against is, is rebellious, right? And it's, you know, you need to put some energy in to get there. And what we'll do when we do this experiment is we put the radio frequency energy in and we see that this going against the field can, sorry, this going with the field can be forced to go against the field and that's what we're measuring is the energy it takes to do that. So now we have two orientations. That's the take home from this. Those magnets can only go in two orientations, either up or down. So I can write that like this. My nucleus can be up or my nucleus can be down. So far, so good. Nothing tricky about that. One or two, diff two, two diff orientations. Well, let's take it into the actual application to the signal shapes. It's all about the neighbors. I have a molecule here in which I'm looking at the signal shape for the red hydrogen. And I have one neighbor. 
And you define a neighbor by being three bonds away. There's one bond, there's two bonds, there's three bonds. If you're more than that away, you probably don't see any coupling. You don't see any interference. So in this sort of three bond coupling, this neighbor coupling, uh, we might call it vicinal coupling, we can see now that that hydrogen, the blue hydrogen, is either up or down compared to the big magnetic field. So when we, and this is the complicated thing, when we hit the resonance frequency for that atom, for that nucleus, this guy is either up or it's down, which is what I've written over there. So I have two permutations. So when we hit the resonance frequency for the red hydrogen, the blue hydrogen is either with the field or against the field. Now, you should be able to extrapolate that to say, okay, when you hit the resonance frequency for the red hydrogen, the blue hydrogen's in two different orientations. So you're gonna get two slightly different frequencies for the red hydrogen in terms of its absorbance. So what we're going to see, where we had a singlet, if we had no neighbors, and that was based on some place on the graph, maybe, you know, whatever PPM, you're going to see a split now, in which it splits to the left and to the right, but the average in the middle is the same as it would be for a singlet. So that doublet now is based on the orientations of the neighbors. The neighbor can be up or down. Two different slight energies, two different slight frequencies for absorption, and therefore a doublet. That's it, two permutations. Ask the same question, what about for the blue hydrogen? What will its shape be? A doublet, we know that because we're using M plus one, but the actual physical idea behind it is that the red hydrogen can also be either up or down. That changes the magnetic field slightly from having no neighbors. You're reinforcing it, or you're taking away from it, you get two slightly different frequencies and you get a split, and that's what we call a doublet. All that text at the bottom is pretty much just what I said, I hope. So here we go, make it a bit more complicated. Where do triplets come from? Where do quartets come from? Well, the argument now might be, for the red hydrogen, how many neighbors? Two. So this hydrogen, when we hit the resonance frequency for the red hydrogen, this blue guy could either be up or down, and this one could either be up or down. More complicated, yes? Certainly more complicated. So not a doublet anymore, not a singlet anymore. We know it's a triplet, but we have to see where it comes from. Well, if I've done this properly, I could argue that when we hit the resonance frequency for the red hydrogen, the signal shape will be affected by the blue hydrogens, and both of those blue hydrogens, this is maybe where you're going, Mike, those two blue hydrogens can either both be up with the field, or they both can be down, that should, that's a typo, they both should be down against the field, okay? Or one can be up and the other one down, or the other one down and the other one up. And the relationship between the energies of these two are the same, right? If they're both equivalent hydrogens, the energies of those two circumstances are the same. So now we can see two outside lines which are smaller, and an inside line which is bigger, and that's a triplet. So it just comes about from the reinforcement of those, that central line based on the fact that you have two of those possibilities. And again, it's an interference pattern, which nicely matches M plus one. So if you have two neighbors, the possible orientations of those magnets when you hit the frequency for the red hydrogen is like that. And I don't think you can come up with any more. If they can only be up or down, that's all you can do. And you get a triplet. Okay, maybe. Think about it. What about the blue hydrogens? How many neighbors? One. What possible orientations do we have for the red hydrogen? Two, up or down. Up or down is what? A doublet. So the patterns make sense. You're happy with that? We can move on. We can do a quartet. The quartet is more complicated again. We won't do a quintet because it'll take all day. But the quartet just, just uh, solidifies this. It makes it make sense. So this is showing you where the N plus 1 stuff comes from. Obviously, that's more complicated. But if you look at it and take your time with it, yes, it fits Pascal's triangle. That's a nice coincidence. coincidence but you can work it out. So for the red hydrogen, I'm looking at its signal. Its signal is affected by the neighbors. How many neighbors do I have? Three. What's N plus 1 then? What shape should I expect? Quartet, but here's where it comes from. This hydrogen, I am seeing its signal on the graph. And I am seeing its signal based on the shape of the signal, based on the orientation of this, which is either up or down, or this, which is either up or down, or this, which is either up or down. Again, more complicated, yes. So I need to have, I've got three hydrogens, I expect three orientations when we hit the resonance frequency for the red hydrogen. If the blue hydrogens are all up, there's one line of that signal. If the blue hydrogens are all down, there's another line, another signal, part of the signal. And there's only one possibility for each of those, right? They can all either be up or they can all either be down. That's why there's only one possibility out there. 
Well, when you start messing with this and you start looking at the other orientations, how about two of them are up, one of them's down? But two different ones are up, a different one is down. Two different ones are up, different one is down. There are three permutations there. If you can find more, let me know because nobody else has done this. Right? That's not worked so far. There are only three. Now, on the right hand side, I can have two down, one up, a different two down with a different one up, or a different two down with a different one up. So now I've got four different orientations, potentially different orientations for the protons next door. And in terms of what they look like, there's the outside line, there's an inside line, there's an inside line, and there's an outside line. That's a quartet. You see it? So it's a fairly simple explanation for where the actual values come from. Now you just have to be happy with how to use it. So I've got doublets, I've got triplets, I've got quartets, and that's where it comes from. And you will see this type of shape on a spectrum, on a graph. You'll see it in, I think, the next lab experiment is based on this stuff, so you'll learn all about that in there. And thinking about homework and thinking about problem sets and uh, sit-down recitation quizzes coming up next week and stuff like that, you're going to have to look at the data and work out a structure. So we've done this very carefully. We started out looking at the basics, where do the signals show, how many signals should there be, and then we went up to signal shape and what that tells you. Well, now we've got to add a few more bits and pieces in terms of data we can get from the graphs, and then we start solving problems. We start putting the pieces together to work the other direction, which is given the graph, what's the product, what's the molecule? That's difficult. Well, I mentioned earlier on that if you have signals in a spectrum in which the two protons involved there, the two types of proton involved there, are actually communicating, they're actually splitting, it turns out the gap between the lines is going to be the same. So these gaps can be measured. This is going to be called a coupling constant, and it's exactly that, it's a constant. And the typ typical constant for the molecules we've looked at so far, which are acyclic alkane type molecules, the typical number is in the 7 to 7.4 region. And what is, where does that come from? Don't forget PPM on the x-axis is a description of hertz. It's a description of energy. So we can actually convert that PPM scale on the, on the chart on the computer and give our numbers in hertz. And if we can measure those differences in hertz, it turns out that this value and this value are the same, and that this value and this value and this value will be the same as the right-hand side, because those two are talking to each other. This will only happen, at least in the signals that you will see, it will only happen if those two signals are actually next to each other. If they protons are next to each other. So this will be very useful. You could have different signals in different parts of the spectrum. One's way down field at 7, the other one's way up field at 1. And if you measure their coupling constants, you can tell that they're neighbors. You can tell that they're actually talking to each other. You'll see why that's useful. So here we go. Uh, first of all, what is the shape for HA? What do you expect to see? Quartet, right? Down field, or at least over here, quartet. Uh, what is the shape for HB? Triplet, because I'm looking at HA and adding 1. So here we go, there's a triplet, there's a quartet. So the J value is always given for you, and that is approximately 7.4 7 hertz. That's a very useful number. You will see as you practice problems that that becomes very useful to be able to tell which protons are next to each other, and therefore overall what's the structure. You can see extrapolating this to biology, to biochemistry, it's very, very powerful now to be able to use these types of ideas to work out very complex structures. So a coupling constant is the gap between the lines within a signal. You can see here that there are some patterns. I mentioned that already, but I'll talk about this in terms of coupling constants too. You're going to see spectra with 10 signals on them. How do you know which signal belongs to which? You've got a bunch of methyl groups in your molecule. You've got a bunch of CH2 groups in your molecule. How do you know which is which and which is connected to which one? You can use the coupling constants to do that. On the left, I have the typical pattern for an ethyl group, CH3, CH2. So CH3, CH2, bonded to something else which doesn't have hydrogens. X could be a bromine or an OH, something like that, or an ETH or something like that. What shape do you expect for the CH3 group? Triplet, right? Two neighbors, triplet. And what shape do you expect for the CH2? Quartet, because I've got three neighbors there for that. And if X is electron withdrawing, the chemical shift should make sense. Now, you will find that the gap between these two lines is the same as the gap between these two lines, and is also the same as the gap between those lines and the inner lines and the outside line if they are coupling. So the coupling constant here might be around 7, 7.1, 7.2, 7.3. And it's useful because then you can tell these two are next to each other in the molecule you're trying to construct. 
you'll be given a formula, you'll be given all the data, you have to put the molecule together. And with that type of extra information, it becomes a lot easier. Because you can start to match patterns in the spectrum. So an ethyl group will always look like that. CH3, CH2 always has this quartet, always has this triplet. We move on to the isopropyl group. Okay, isopropyl group with something attached. We have a hydrogen in the middle. We have a CH3 at the end here, and we have a CH3 at the end there. Those two CH3 groups are the same. Should be okay with that. Chemical equivalence, magnetic equivalence. In the middle over here, I have one single hydrogen. You can see down here it's a tiny signal. It's only worth one, and it's split into a whole bunch of lines, so the signal gets smaller. So it's still the same area, one hydrogen, but it's smaller because now the lines are split. So what is the shape for the hydrogen in the circle? Septet. So I've got six protons. I've got n plus one is seven. We call that a septet. And that's what's shown down here. Now, you'll ask the question, I can't see that septet. Well, you'll find from now on that the actual data will be given to you underneath as well in a linear form. So you'll be able to see exactly what is in there. You'll see the shape and the coupling constant and the chemical shift, and it's all in there. Well, what about the CH3 groups? How many neighbors? One. What shape? Doublet, right? So there's a doublet. Not quite the same heights. That's probably not a great picture, but they should be about the same heights. And that's a six hydrogen doublet. So that's definitely an isopropyl group every time. How do you tell it's an isopropyl group? How do you tell this septet is not just something off on its own and this 6H doublet is something different, not attached? You measure the gaps between. The gap between those two lines will be the same as the gaps between these lines. That's the coupling constant. That's what it's used for. Now, in most examples that we've seen so far, everything's been a simple uh, acyclic alkane type system. And the reason we get these typical coupling constants of about seven is all to do with Newman depictions. Going all the way back to Newman depictions, what do things prefer to exist as in, in the eclipsed form or in the staggered form? Staggered, right? So you're going to see possibilities where hydrogens on neighboring atoms, there's a, a Newman depiction, there's a hydrogen at the front, there's a hydrogen at the back, they're neighbors. And they're going to sort of see, you know, the, the number that you get, seven, is kind of an average of all the possibilities of where those things can be orientated relative to each other. And that's where it comes from, if you have a freely rotating cycle. In terms of patterns, let's finish this off. Ethyl, dead easy. Isopropyl, very obvious when you're trying to build a complex molecule. T-butyl, not, not a big fan of that picture because it has this little shoulder there. Ignore the shoulder. What shape should a T-butyl group show as? Singlet, right? T-butyl has three methyl groups and something else attached here. So each of those methyl groups is equivalent, but no neighbors. X is not a hydrogen, so there's no splitting. So you see this large 9H singlet. Where do you think you'll see it in the spectrum if it's a T-butyl group? To the left downfield or to the right upfield? Upfield, right? It's a simple alkyl group, so it should be upfield. So you see a big singlet around 1 ppm? That's most likely a T-butyl group. That is really straightforward. Just to make sure this is OK, how do we know this, this signal at the bottom is not an ethyl group? The J values are different. The gap between there is different to the gap between there. They're not talking to each other. Okay? They are different. So now we've got most of what we need to start solving problems. We've got most of the bits and pieces we need to start putting spectra together and think about the other direction. So here's one of the applications of this. On the left, I have a benzene derivative. I have a bunch of signals. I expect a bunch of signals. I think this is somewhat simple because it's symmetrical. By that, I mean this on the left should be the same if this on the right, because it's symmetrical down the middle. This should be different, but the same as this one. That might simplify things. That's what we do in recitation, is run through these things. I have a CH2 group down there. I have a CH3 here. I have a CH2 there and a CH3 here. So if you look at the very simple ex experiments or exercises I put on the web there to practice this stuff, so you can look at the number of signals, where they should be, and maybe what shape they are, I could argue we've got one type, two types, three types, four types, five types, six types of signal. Six types of proton means six signals. And you put that onto a spectrum, you're looking for alkyl up here, alkyl down here. What type are these? O neighbor. ARH, ARH. What type is this? Benzylic. Benzylic. You need to know this by yesterday. Benzylic. Okay, so now from the chart, you can expect to put the pieces together and put a graph together. But what about shapes? What shape should the red hydrogens be? Triplet, what about the blue hydrogens? Quartet. Down at the bottom, what about, I don't know what color that is. Any, any guesses? Chartreuse? I have no idea what that is. 
Uh, what's the shape of that signal? Triplet, you've got three na two neighbors. What about the uh, scary green ones? What shape are they? Quartet, right? So now the problem is you're going to get two signals, both of which have triplets and quartets. How do you know which is which? You'll do the chemical shifts a little bit, but then you'll see a spectrum like that. If you pr predict this using ChemDraw, which you can do uh, to practice more yourself, you'll see that you get the two ARH type absorbances all the way down there. Seven, which makes sense. That's where they should show. And what about this? It's fairly easy to see which one this is. That's a quartet, which is either the, C the blue CH2 or the green CH2. Which one is it? It's down at 4 ppm, so is it next? It's the, it's the uh, green, right, because that's next to the O. So that would be OCH2. And then this one would be the other one. This one would be the benzylic blue CH2. The problem is here. Now, for an organic chemist or a pharmaceutical chemist, it's absolutely necessary you know which, which, is, which is which. And as you go into bioorganic and bio, um, biochemistry and you think about protein structure, which is way more complicated than this, you absolutely have to know which signal belongs to which as you're studying a material. So how do you know which is which here? We've got a problem. You might well be able to measure their coupling constants. There's the actual definitions. You might well be able to measure their coupling constants, which are the gaps between those signals. On the computer, we can expand this thing. We can make it bigger. So it's large. And then you can measure exactly what's in between. You can measure the gaps in between those lines. And one of those signals might have a coupling constant of 7.1, and the other one might have a coupling constant of 7.2. And that's enough difference. Because downfield, one of these signals will be 7.1, one of these will be 7.2, and you can match them. You can say exactly which they belong to. And that's very useful and very powerful. So we have, take a list so far, chemical shift, where the proton shows based on its le electronic environment. We have so far uh, the size of the signal, or the area under the curve, which is about the integration, which gives you the number of each type. You have the shape of the signal. The shape of the signal tells you the neighbors. Triplet means two neighbors, quartet means three neighbors, stuff like that. And then you have the coupling constant. The coupling constant is the last sort of icing on the cake that often helps you solve tiny little problems within problems. So we have lots of information, lots of powerful information. But we've done simple examples. We have to get to the point where we can do complex examples. What this, graph, what, what this slide is going to show you is that n plus 1 will work even if your neighbors are on different carbons. If you look back to what we've done so far, all the n plus 1 stuff we have done has been about this with one type of neighbor, this with one type of neighbor, and then over here, this doesn't have any neighbors. It's been fairly simple, where n plus 1 was based on the carbon here and the carbon here communicating. What if you have carbons in a row? How do they communicate? Well, fortunately, you do the same thing. The difference in this molecule, for those of you taking notes, is that, let's say, the red hydrogens have two different types of neighbor now. We didn't see that yet. We saw the, uh, I don't know, pink hydrogens at the end have one type of neighbor, the green. And the blue hydrogens have one type of neighbor, the red. That's what we did. We really didn't talk about green and red in terms of having multiple types of neighbors. Now make a note of this. If the molecule is acyclic, and if the molecule is free to rotate, as we saw with Newman depictions a while back, it turns out the coupling constants average out, and it works. So n plus 1 will work, even if you have protons to your left and to your right. You simply add them together and add 1. And that's the shape of your signal. So the interference patterns will be the same for acyclic systems. It gets way more complicated in other systems where it's cyclized or where it's an alkene. But in an acyclic system where it's freely rotating, you get average coupling constants of about 7, 7.1 hertz. That's useful. That tells you that the signal should add up in an n plus 1 sense and that will give you the same outcome. So to start that out, now, the pink hydrogens, what shapes should the signal be? Triplet, we've got two neighbors. Where should it show in the spectrum, to the left or to the right? To the right, a simple alkyl. The green hydrogens, how many neighbors? I see five, right? So how many lines in the signal? Six. And then I see down here, red hydrogens, how many neighbors? Four, how many lines in the signal? Five, quintet. And then the blue hydrogens are fairly simple because they only have neighbors on one side. What shape? Triplet. What type of protons are they from your chart? CL neighbor, where should they show? Downfield. Right downfield, three and a half, four, something like that. So now we should be able to predict the spectrum. In my spectrum here, I have a triplet 
for the pink, that was correct. I have a triplet for the blue, that's correct. And if you look at those lines, that looks an awful lot like a, uh, is that, that's six, is it? And this one is five, that's a quintet, and that's a sextet. And why are the chemical shifts changing gradually? What, if these are alkyl groups, why are they starting to move downfield? They're getting closer to the CL. They're getting closer to the CL. Yeah, so that will affect this, the field slightly and drag it downfield a little bit. So N plus 1 applies for simple systems that are acyclic. And you can start to get lots of information from these graphs by doing exactly that. And those, that works. So context. I'm going to ask you to draw spectra. You've got to be able to put those things together. We have a situation here in which we went from simple systems that were freely rotating, acyclic systems that were all about you know the Newman depictions and all about the uh, anti and the gauche and the all that sort of stuff and what we did here is we went to a system that was rigid we went to a system in which we have a pi bond and what pi bonds can't do is rotate if you can't rotate you've got a problem here in the spectroscopy in the NMR spectroscopy that's a problem because you get different interference patterns if you can't rotate you can't average out like we did for the other systems so now, HA, let's focus on HA. This is the signal for HA. It isn't a quartet. It's not a quartet because a quartet has lines that are defined shape. Two outside are shorter, two inside are higher. This is not a quartet. And if you came into this straight away and decided that you're going to use M plus 1, as we have been doing, it wouldn't work. If you look at the signal for HA, how many neighbors does it have on the adjacent carbon? Two. And if you have two neighbors so far, what should it show us? Triplet. That ain't a triplet. It's got too many lines to be a triplet. That is nowhere near a triplet. So there's something different happening here. Well, we have a situation now where that proton is stuck in a certain relationship with that proton. What word could I use? What's the orientation between those two protons on an alkene? Come on, somebody said it. Cis. And that proton is stuck in a relationship with that proton, which is what? That's trans. That is a trans relationship. And guess what? You can't rotate. So you can't average out like you did for the other system. Now, for reasons that are sort of beyond the scope of what we're doing, you get different coupling constants if you're cis or trans. And these are numbers you should know. This will help you decide at the end of a problem, I have an alkene, is it cis or is it trans? These numbers will help you work that out. It turns out that for the relationship between HA and the trans proton, J is about 16 hertz, much bigger than an alkane type system. And the relationship for the cis is about 12 hertz. So those are numbers you should know. Cis is 12 hertz, trans is 16 hertz. Well, guess what? We said so far that if you have neighbors on different carbons to your left and right, and you have the same average coupling constant, n plus 1 works. And if you have a proton over here and a proton over here, that's 2, you'll see a triplet for the middle proton. Because that works in acyclic systems which are freely rotating. Now you're not rotating. Now you're stuck in this rigid alkene. So we will see HA split twice. This is now like two different neighbors which are coupling differently to HA. So we will see a split of 16 hertz between HA and the trans proton. And we'll see a split of that signal into two lines again by the blue proton, the cis proton. So the first one is a doublet from the trans orientation. And then those two lines get split again into doublets. So what we're developing here is something called a doublet of doublets. Doublet of doublets. And that tells you maybe you have an alkene in there. All of a sudden, we've got useful information. Those two lines now, those two different uh, numbers, will tell you if you've got a cis or a transalkene. Now, we draw this as, as follows. There's the initial HA if it was a singlet. That's if there was no splitting. When we draw these little triangles, which you know, I can show you how to do this, if maybe the honors people will do this sort of stuff, um, we split it into a doublet based on the large coupling constant first. So that gap, that's now a doublet based on HA splitting with the trans proton. The large one comes first when we draw this picture. After that, 
that doublet gets split again by the cis proton. And that gives you now two doublets of doublets. So that DD is not a quartet. It's telling you that you have a cis or a transalkene. In this case, you have one of each. So again, trans is bigger, cis is smaller. That's very helpful. Coupling constants are your friend, if you know what they're there for, if you know what they're available for, and what, what, how to use them. If not, they're nonsense. 